Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. A portion of today's program is originating from the beautiful state of Oregon. In fact, one of the scenic beauties of this northwestern state is in the background, Mount Hood rising to excess of 11,000 feet, snow-covered and cloud-shrouded, but nevertheless, a most beautiful sight. We are near the town of Prineville in Crook County, Oregon, where we're looking into the agricultural situation by visiting with two fine NFO members in that area. I'm talking about George and Doug Fernback, whose ranch is located some six miles from Prineville. Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report, seen on this station each week at this time. I am delighted today to welcome to U.S. Farm Report two members of the Board of Directors of the National Farmers Organization. On my right is Mr. Glenn Utley of Fort Branch, Indiana, and on my left is Willis Rao of Edgewood, Iowa. Glenn, Willis, very nice to have you with us today. Real nice to be here, too, Bill. You know, I'm afraid to mention the fact that Glenn is the oldest member of the Board of Directors. That's not quite right, is it, uh, Willis? No, I don't, I don't think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should say, Glenn, that in terms of longevity and point of service, that you have served longer than any of the other board members. How long that, have you served the board? That would sound maybe a little better. <laughs> However, they're both pretty close. Bill. Is that right? Uh, I've been on the board since 1956. 1956. Yes. How about you, Willis? How long have you been a member? I came on the board of directors in the, uh, December of 1964. 1964. I'm completing my fourth term. Well, you're sort of a junior compared to this fellow right. over here, aren't you? Right, and I recognize that, too. Glenn, uh, through the years, uh, you've seen a great number of transitional changes in the organization. Tell us about it. Well, Bill, I think to start with, uh, just talk about the first convention that I ever attended at St. Joe, Missouri. There was about 250 to 300 delegates there. And uh, we thought at that time we had a pretty big convention. <laughs> but as we built on and scattered into more states organizing, and uh, we built the organization today across the 48 states, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, Phenomenal, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure proud to have a part of it. From that attendance of 250 to 300 delegates in the convention in 19, what, 56, she uh -huh. said, uh, the organization has grown to an attendance of, what, 12,000 at last year's convention? This is right, 12,000. This makes quite a difference. Well, I think that indicates, indeed, the growth. That's right. Well, now... In the practices of NFO, in its philosophical structure, Glenn, uh, what changes have you seen take place? Well, when we started in the collective bargaining bill in, in 1958, which was altogether a different story than what it was when we started in the 56, we practically started the organization over. Mm -hmm. And, of course, as we built on, uh, got into newer states, we had to pick up more help, as we got into those states to carry them on. And this is how we built our organization. A lot of it was with volunteer help, and there's no end to the praise that you can give those people out there that work for nothing to do this job for agriculture. Then as we <clears throat> built on to get bigger, then it come to commodity departments. The first department that we ever set up in a commodity was meat. Mr. Fankston headed that up at that time and he was going around talking to processors. And then, as we got bigger, we added the grain department, we've added the dairy department, we've added the specialties 
department. Mm -hmm. We've added a feeder calf division. And this has all took people and to staff, not only the boys to head these departments, but the staff around them. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of these departments. I've seen a lot of these boys start at the bottom of this organization in organizing and work their way up through to where they're at at this time and have built a good staff around them mm -hmm. and are doing a wonderful job. I'm proud of them. Well, now, Willis, uh, you're an Iowan, and uh, this is the birthplace of NFO. Right. So you've been close to national headquarters, and I would presume that you will corroborate what Glenn has just said about the development of leadership here at the national level. Definitely, Bill. This is one of the great sources of pride of the, of the entire NFO organization. We are so proud that we've been able to attract the good, young, vigorous leadership that it takes. And uh, frankly, we're headed for the best group of leadership that the American agriculture has ever seen. Uh, we feel we're close to the goal now, but we keep striving to improve mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. So many of these young fellows uh, have come back to agriculture. Uh, I think you know that they have uh, grown up on the farms, they've uh, become educated, they went out into other industry, but now NFO is giving them an opportunity to come back to what they love best, and that's agriculture. Right. It's sort of stemming the tide that prevailed for a while of these young people on the farms leaving the farms, and now we're getting them back into agriculture, which I think is highly important. Wouldn't you agree, This Glenn? is right. This is highly important. Well, Glenn, you really pioneered collective bargaining in your home state of Indiana, did you not? This is right, Bill. How I'll, did it go back in those uh, days? Well, I'll tell you, those first meetings that were held were really something. Uh, the people would come into those meetings, and I'd say probably half of them uh, didn't think collective bargaining would work. Your business people down the street were again you. And uh, they were kind of rough, some of those meetings <laughs> was. You had a pretty hard time, I'll tell you, holding your own in some of them. But this is all behind us now, Bill. Uh, we have meetings now. The business people are beginning to realize what it means to have a price in agriculture, what it means to them, and the farmers are realizing it. And it's a little different story than it used to be. Is NFO in all of the counties of Indiana, Glenn? We like about three counties yet, Bill, and they don't have very much production. Well, I'm going to have to send you home and put you to work. I'll we need those yeah, three counties. This is right. <laughs> this is what they've been telling me upstairs. Well, since 1959, Willis, I'm sure you've seen a tremendous amount of progress for NFO in your state of Iowa. Tell us about it. It's almost hard to believe, Bill, what we've seen in the state of Iowa. From a, a handful of members in many of the counties in Iowa to having all of the counties chartered, a substantial membership in all counties. Now we have 35 collection points just to market the hogs that go through our marketing programs. Five plants that we deliver directly to with hogs, and then five packing plants that we deliver directly to with our beef. How many counties are there in Iowa? There are 99. And you have 99. We have 99 chartered and a part of our program. You bet. What, uh, what do you feel philosophically uh, NFO means to the average American farmer? I think the NFO is offering the family farmers some hope that there is a way that they can economically compete with the, the well-organized buyers of farm products, that there is a way these things can be done. And farmers are realizing that no matter what the problem is, there is an answer, but you must work at it. You, you must have a program and then work toward a goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any other organization, farm organization you know of, that uh, is dedicated, as NFO is, to getting the farmer a price for his product? No, and there certainly doesn't seem to be any on the any of the horizon. Mm -hmm. No matter which way you look, the NFO seems to stand alone for collective bargaining and fair prices for farmers. Mm -hmm. Glenn, would you agree that the prosperity of the farmer and the prosperity of the small town or rural businessman are hand in glove? This is right, and this is what is beginning to be understood out there too, Bill. Uh, now, back a few years ago, I'd say in a lot of cases as late as a year ago, there was a lot of the business people didn't realize the importance 
of agriculture to them on Main Street. Uh, you mentioned uh, maybe a corporate farm to them or something. It didn't uh, didn't stick. Mm -hmm. But today they're beginning to realize that uh, that dollar in agriculture returns seven. You know. Yes. And their cash register is not ringing quite as good as it has been in the past, and they're beginning to understand. You just uh, said corporate farms. Let's talk about that a minute. This is uh, something that's very much with us these days. The large corporate structures moving into the rural areas, buying farmland, and uh, oftentimes, if not most of the time, buying it at uh, its loan value, which uh, is what normally? Half the, the actual value of the land? Something like that. I think to uh, really explain, Bill, the, what a corporate farm means, and uh, means to a community, I'm going to use an example back home, pretty close to where I live, there is a corporate farm. And I know this place, know the operation of it. And, uh, you know, our business people in that county seat town, which is a small town, about eight, ten thousand, 10,000, seem to think it was a real good place because they'll hold their meetings out there once in a while and they'll have headlines in the paper and looking at the cattle and the mm -hmm. hogs and how a wonderful place it is. Well, here some time back, I spoke to that group of business people on the importance of agriculture and the family farm. So I knew the most of them, and I just told them, I said, uh, you seem to think quite a bit of this corporate farm out here, and you don't seem to be too interested in the family farm. Now, I said, uh, I just pointed them out. I know them. I said to the gasoline man sitting there, I said, how much is gasoline? they use on that farm out there, do they buy from you? He shook his head, none. I said, no, they have their own refinery. Mm -hmm. The fertilized man, he had to shake his head, no. I said, no, they have their own fertilized company. To the machinery dealer that was sitting there, I said, how much of that machinery out there do they buy from you? None. Well, they get it directly from the company. So I said, at this point, I said, I never owned a business in town. I don't know much about it. But I said, I believe one without any customers wouldn't be any good. And you sat here and admitted to me that they don't buy anything from you. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the best explanation I know of of a corporate farm and what it does to these small communities, these small towns. They're going to disappear. Willis, what about Iowa? <clears throat> is the corporate farm being felt in Iowa? Is it developing this kind of trend? We have some spots where it's developing, Bill. It's, it's not anything that's out in the open so far that, that everybody is completely aware of it. But certainly the seeds are there, the nucleus is there, and they are developing. Uh, we have to feel the impact of them because of their methods of operation. Mm -hmm. uh, bypassing the local businessman to get their supplies, bypassing the local market to sell their supplies, all of these, these things have a direct effect on everyone in the community and in the state. U.S. Farm Report, a gentleman recently made a field trip through the states of Texas, California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. Our purpose was to film and report the agricultural scene in those areas. We happened to be in an area around a small community called Prineville, Oregon, where we visited on the farm of two fine NFO members a father-son operation, George and Doug Fernback. Among other things that we discussed about agriculture, we did talk that day about this problem that we've been talking about, the corporate farm, and what it has done to their particular area. Let's listen and watch that interview at this time. Doug, as I understand it, uh, your farming operation here near Prineville is a father-son partnership, right? Right, right. Any more uh, Fernbackers in this family? Nope, nope. That were just the two of us. He's uh, he's all right, isn't he, George? For an only son, they're they're supposed to be a little troublesome. I think he's doing yeah. okay. I'm glad he's here. I'll tell you the <laughs> truth. <laughs> I'll bet you are. Yeah. How yeah. many acres uh, do you farm here? We farm roughly a thousand with our what we own and what we rent. And what is your production on the thousand acres, uh, Doug? 
You mean for crop wise? Yes. Oh, we uh, produce about roughly 1,800 ton of potatoes, and we run about all oh, roughly 1,500 head of cattle, and then the rest of it goes into feed for these cattle. Right. Let's get back to your potato production here. You're highly mechanized, I suppose, to try to achieve some efficiency in this potato crop. Correct. And uh, what has this done for you price-wise in this area? Well, the price has gone down considerably. Uh, when we moved to this area in 49, my dad received $3 a sack for potatoes, and at that time we had much more expensive operation because it was all, you know, hand labor. Uh -huh. And now, 20 years later, the price today is $2.10 a hundredweight, and we have cut our cost for in harvesting down some, but our cost for fertilizer and our land values and everything have gone up, so the price is way out of line with what we've actually saved by going mechanization. Well, fellas, wherever we go across the country, gleaning the agricultural story for U.S. Farm Report, uh, the story remains pretty much the same. Uh, George, I'm sure you've been through it for years. Efficiency right. is going up, production costs are going up, but what's happening to the prices? Price is going down. There you definitely. are. There you are. Yeah, we just got a tax statement yesterday, and for our operation here, it went up over $700 from last year. Well, what about the uh, fellas in this area in the potato business? Uh, have you uh, have you plowed some under? Oh, yes, yes. We plowed 4% uh, of our, our crop under this year. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about price, George? Do you have any idea about what to do about it? Yes, just as soon as uh, the good members in this area get their potatoes under storage, we're going to go to fighting, and we're going to get this price up, or they're not going to get them. Well, this is one of the one of the really great advantages of organizing, of uh, getting together, of working together, and blocking together, isn't it, this under is NFO? True. Just like I talked to a man in Jefferson County last night, and uh, he talked to the people in Klamath, and uh, the communication in this thing is the most wonderful thing I've ever got into. Uh, before, the buyers, they used to uh, tell us one thing, we had to believe it. Now all we've got to do is pick up a telephone. We know what's going on back east, the Middle West, and any place you want to know. It's the greatest group I've ever got into. I think the communication probably is the greatest factor in solving so many of these problems. It used to it's be that you guys had to believe uh, right. just about anything that anybody wanted to tell you, and this you really right. had no authoritative source for information. But now, indeed, you do have, right? Oh, this is wonderful. You bet. We can get the answers in a matter of minutes, mm -hmm. you bet. Let's talk about your uh, cattle operation here. How many cattle do you run, Doug? Well, we start out buying in the fall, and uh, depending on how good a summer we had for feed, we normally buy between 1,500 and 2,500. Mm -hmm. And we do some custom feeding. And then we start as they get up to, oh, say, 750 pounds, we start putting them in the feedlot. And then those that we don't put in the feedlot in the winter, we go to pasture with. And what kind of pasture is it? Is it grass? It's all land? irrigated yeah. pasture, yes. Mm -hmm. It's a mix of legume and grasses. Right. And then um, in the summer, as once again, we go through about, oh, once every 30 to 60 days, and we cut out the big ones and put them on a finishing feed also. Mm -hmm. Now, what's your cattle market? It's, uh, it was real good, and now it's slipping very fast. We... Uh, we have a problem out here in that we don't have enough of the feeders NFO yet. Mm -hmm. And so consequently in this area, a lot of us are backing up and selling feeders instead of selling finished animals. Mm -hmm. And Dad and I are seriously considering doing this with what we have left this year. Well now, with, with your fat cattle, uh, can't you uh, block them elsewhere in the country and get a price under NFO? Uh, this is, we're trying to work out a deal now. We have a little problem with transportation, of course, doing this. And, uh, but we've got one packer over in the Willamette Valley that's working with us 100%, and he takes our NFO beef, and he's paying us more than market, but he can only do so much when mm -hmm. the big boys keep undercutting him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, just like Dad and I sold a load of heifers yesterday, weighing about 900 pounds, all choice for 2550 and uh, this is not a break-even yeah. deal. Yeah. George, you made some comments to me a little while ago that I found to be very interesting about the uh, rural businessman and the small community. Now, for example, in Prineville, which I guess is your community, right. your mailing address, uh, the support that uh, you feel is coming from the businessman who 
is realizing that uh, the strength of your economy out on the farm is indeed the strength of his economy in the town. This is right. No, if, uh, if they let corporations take over here, our little town of Prineville will be a ghost town because uh, we spend our money here. Prineville is a, a going community, I a think. A real going community. What's the population there? About 70, 7,200, 7, yeah. I believe, yeah. It looks prosperous. It has a good look about it. Right. Of right. course, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, of the lumber industry yeah. in, in the Prineville area, too, isn't there? Yes, uh, lumber, uh, what is it? It isn't, uh, I think agriculture still leads in Prineville. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't mm -hmm. know the percentage, but. Uh, we have already <clears throat> explained to our audience that this is a uh, sportsman's paradise, this country. Right. You yes, indeed. I suppose you guys uh, do find a little time to pursue that uh, that hobby, don't you? Uh, yeah, we we get to do our share, <laughs> I think, of deer hunting, bird yeah. hunting. Right. Now you're raising grain, barley and wheat. Right. Uh, you've had no market on that either. Oh, have it's you? terrible. Terrible. Yeah. How I much are work. you raising? How many acres of your land is in grain? Oh, what about a third? About 350 acres. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you storing, George? We're storing and, and then feed to our fat cattle. Uh -huh. uh, it's no price today. It's about 40 bucks a ton. Yeah. It's way below our cost. Well, now, <clears throat> although NFO in this area, numerically, isn't exactly as strong as we would like, right. it's coming, isn't it's it? It's coming fast, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been doing a lot of hard work, as I understand it, we in try behalf to. of the organization. Uh, is the influence of NFO felt to a point where you're able to, uh, as an individual, make some uh, some uh, contracts or gentlemen's agreements with the uh, people to whom you sell yes. to your advantage? Would you explain that? Well, yes, it's increased. Well, like on cattle, we're getting about a half a cent more than the other are. And uh, potatoes, they're willing to talk to us for a little better price. Uh, grain hasn't been yet, but we feel that it's coming. Mm -hmm. It's well, going to take time. Tell them about last year when uh, we got the three dollars and they didn't believe us in taking a dollar eighty-five twenty-five miles from us. Yeah, what about that? Well, um, yeah, the uh, the boys here said they wasn't going to let any potatoes go less than three dollars a hundred weight, net to the grower. Mm -hmm. And the boys twenty twenty-five miles away from us, they laughed at us, said it can't be done. Well, these boys here are good, strong NFOs, and they just uh, set on them. There wasn't a spud left to Prineville Valley under three dollars a hundred net to the grower. Mm -hmm. Well, NFO is being felt here, felt advantageously, as as I see it. Although uh, there are no existing contracts at this time, you're you're looking for those, right? And they're going to happen, aren't they? You bet. Upon our arrival here. We looked up to see Doug and his dad, George, on horses coming up to greet us, and they were accompanied by what looked like a herd of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> now, that isn't so strange to have dogs on a ranch, but uh, I am intrigued by the fact that you have two St. Bernards and another dog uh, that is a, a really a, a rare breed as far as I'm concerned. I've never seen this breed of dog before. How come St. Bernards, Doug? I've always been in love with them since I was a little tiny kid, and I built a trailer for a fella that raises them, and he gave me one, and then he gave Dad one, and then we started raising them. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand it's not a bad crop. A lot better paying than any other thing we can raise. That's I don't sure. know. Uh, I don't know whether uh, we can do anything about raising prices on St. Bernard's through NFO, <laughs> but I guess we could give her a try, couldn't we, George? <laughs> you bet we'll give her a try. <laughs> now, this other dog uh, that I was talking about, what breed of dog is this? He's a Norwegian elk hound, and uh, they came from Norway. They were used both as a work animal and also to hunt game. Mm -hmm. Is he a pretty tough uh, animal? He... Uh, He's a fairly small dog for a sled dog. I right, would say. they're a muscular animal. Dad's um, border collie thinks he's an awful tough animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doug and George, it's been a real pleasure talking with you all, and uh, I want to wish you well. Lots of good luck, and uh, certainly we're hoping that uh, NFO grows as we're anticipating it will grow through this part of Oregon. If I can say one more thing, this is one thing that I have 
learned and met the nicest people through NFO, people that uh, all over the world, uh, United States, I yes. should say. Uh -huh. And, uh, well, the people you like to be with. We have, I think, uh, concluded on this particular field trip, during which time we have covered the states of Texas, California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Colorado, that, number one, progressive farmers belong to NFO, and number two, and even perhaps more importantly, that NFO farmers are the greatest people in the world, just from the standpoint of being nice folks, being hospitable, cooperative, and helpful. And you two people uh, certainly fall into that category, and we thank you, and it's been a pleasure having you on U.S. Farm Report. Now there, gentlemen, are two fine people. I feel like they're my neighbor because well, I know they're, they're bargaining collectively the same as I am here. It's absolutely right. And uh, they were just delightful and most hospitable to us. Uh, they had us in for lunch, and uh, we should have had a Mrs. Farron back on because she is a right good cook, but I don't think she wanted to face uh, the camera. And I like to enjoy <laughs> that cooking, you know. They're really good. Yes, indeed. Well, now, both of you are farmers. Right. Where's your farm, Willis? My farm is at Edgewood, Iowa, about six miles north of the little town of Edgewood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How big a place do you have? 400 acres. And what do you grow there? We grow corn, we grow hay, we grow pasture, we grow black Angus cattle. Hey, that uh, sounds all right. It's about lunchtime for me, and I wouldn't mind having one of those uh, good marbled Angus steaks about They're the best. Yes, they, they are. Right. They're great. How about you, Glenn? Well, I farm about uh, 400 acres, uh, Fort Branch, Indiana. That's mm -hmm. down in the southwest corner of Indiana. Mostly grain at this time. I used to produce quite a bit of livestock, but I got going on the road so much for NFO <laughs> that I cut the livestock yeah. out. I want to thank both of you for being my guest today on U.S. Farm Report. This has been most interesting, and uh, I've really enjoyed having you. I've enjoyed being with you, too, Bill. Thank you. Willis, hope you come back again and be on our show at a later date. Oh. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Bill. Our guests have been Mr. Glenn Utley on my right from Fort Branch, Indiana, and Mr. Willis Rowell on my left of the state of Iowa, his place near Edgewood. These gentlemen are members of the board of directors of the National Farmers Organization. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.